Hello. How's it going? All right. Psyched. That's great. Well, it's been a. If you haven't been in here today, I'm sorry for your loss and missing a wonderful day of programming. Um, so this is. I'm really excited to to kind of cap the the day of programming with these lightning talks. We we have had uh, lots of great people step up and volunteer to to uh, to do this, and I and I appreciate it. Um, so. We have uh, Dave Rice, Hannah Frost, Eric Peel, Catherine Gronsbell, Casey Davis, and then we have uh, Karen and Mar Mark, what's your last name? I'm sorry. Bussy. Bussy? Okay, Bussy, yeah. Uh, so so thank, thanks to all of you for uh, agreeing to do this. Um, yeah, so with that, I think I'll, we'll just kick it off. Uh, Dave Rice, where are you? Oh, there you are. All right, once again, Dave Rice. <laughs> I, I usually use the half hour before my presentation to prepare for my presentation, but I don't have it. <laughs> so what's this going to be seven minutes, up to seven minutes for presentation. We'll have extra time at the very end for general Q&A and discussion. So we won't do Q&A following each presentation. All right, so it, when I was back in my baby archivist days of Democracy Now!, we used LTO tape, and it was LTO 3, and it was really, really hard. And then. <laughs> A few years ago, this thing happened called LTFS, which I'm going to talk to you about. Um, uh, the LTO tape version 5, it supports this thing called linear tape file system. So you can write a file system onto a tape as if it's like a hard drive. So it makes it, it, makes it really nice. You can plug your tape into your deck, and you can mount it as if it's a hard drive. Uh, there's a lot of things you can't do. You can't copy two files off of it at once very well. It's linear, so the files are in different physical places. and uh, you can't get to them independently as well as you can on a hard drive, but it makes uh, access to digital storage quite cheap, cheap and quick. Um, an LTO deck, I think it runs, like LTO 5, I think is right about, right about $1,700 right now, and the tapes are about 25 bucks for a terabyte and a half. So if you got some storage problems, sometimes LTO helps you out. And so one thing, one thing I want to point out about LTO is that almost all the vendors, or possibly all the vendors that right now make LTO uh, uh, decks, uh, release um, these uh, tools. Um, I'm not sure if they're totally open source or a little mysterious. I'm a little suspicious about them, but they all, all uh, share the same tools uh, that help you manage LTFS. These are command line tools, but they present a GUI called LTFS Manager. So there's one called LTFS and just lets you mount the tape. Uh, there's one called LTFS Check for some diagnostic issues. There's one to erase it. Um, but basically this lets you mount the tape. And one thing that it turned out to be a big bonus for this is that the file system is stored, at, uh, expressed in an XML where you have uh, an, like a big nest of all your directories, the files, you get information on like the normal file attributes like name, the modification date, um, the size of it. So at my job at City, City University of New York when we write out LTO tapes, when we got some preservation going on, uh, we take these XMLs and we just have them uploaded into our database and that gives us access to like all this uh, file system information. Um, I feel like LTO is something that is a lot more approachable than, than people think. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's options out there from you know, free to enormously expensive and I feel like the free stuff is, is often quite overlooked. But all the, you know, almost all the vendors, or possibly all the vendors, um, you know, put out the software uh, you know, in multiple platforms for Linux, Mac, and Windows that lets you, you know, mount tapes kind of in the same way you would treat hard drives, you push files in there and get like, you know, an XML back that says what you did, what's there, what's left. Yeah, that's lightning talkish, right? Is that good? Yeah. Did, did, I, did I go too short? That's like, what? <laughs> can, I, can I go back to QC tools then? <laughs> And I can't take any questions, right? There's like a rule about that? All right, we can spend three minutes with questions. Sweet. Three minutes. All right, if somebody asks a question, I'm going to call on James Snyder. And, uh, <laughs> Bring it on, baby. Bring it on. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. wait. Uh, so. Do you have a tool that you specifically like for LTO, for LTFS? Uh, I mean, some people like Brew. Like, it's kind of a, it's kind of a middle range. I mean, it's like 500 bucks, I think, for Brew. It's just BRU. Um, it lets. It supports both LTFS and the older school method of just like piping a tar file right out to a, to a tape. 
Um, you know, so it's kind of mid-level one, and then there's certainly really expensive ones, or or like companies that try to pretend that LTF LTO tapes are video tapes and stripe uh, MPEG-2 across it all day. Um, but but uh, no, I've heard good stuff about Brew, but I haven't used it myself. Um, you know, for the most part, the, the tools we're using for LTO are really low low end. They're we're just using command line tools, but little shell scripts to help make it a little easier. Um, but I work at a television station, and we probably have about like 15 users who like know how to like look up a tape in the database, grab a file off of it, and have a nice day. You know? Yeah, it's true. Sometimes you'll be like, I want to copy off file A and file B, and it'll be like a half mile between them on the tape. So often, like, you'll try to copy a file off, and it like nothing will happen. It'll just, you know because the tape is like rolling up to the to the file, um, and then it'll start start moving pretty quickly. Like usually, I'm getting about 120 megabytes per second off LTO5 tape right now. So you you know the best is to like read on and off of it in in bulk, especially when you're writing onto it. Uh, one thing I, like we work in a Mac environment, and one piece of advice I'd really recommend is if, if you're mounting LTO tapes into the Mac file system, the Mac file system uh, and the operating system anticipates that everything is going to be as responsive as a hard drive, whereas with the LTO, like some of the things take a while to actually perform um, because of the delay. And in the Mac, one of the things the Mac likes to do is make little pretty thumbnails for all your files. So if you have a hard drive quick times, so it'll try to make little tiny pictures of each one of them. And if it's trying to do that on an LTO tape, it's going to be so sluggish because it has to like move, you know, from like one one uh, section of tape to the other. So in the Finder and the preferences, you can be like, you know, shut off all the icons. I don't want to see any of that. I'm only going to enable file attributes that actually live in the LTO XML, and that's not the thumbnail. And that makes LTO much more responsive. But on forums all the time, I see people like, oh, this is so slow. It's horrible. Oh, these little thumbnails are showing up though. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry guys. Thanks. Is this your phone, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> Eric, I need you. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Hannah. Okay. <laughs> Eric. I got nothing. This is not taking part of my time, is it? <laughs> Microsoft PowerPoint has encountered a problem. <clears throat> Let's try it again. Drat. I don't have to do it in presenter mode if... Yeah, maybe just... Export it as a PDF really real quick. Work. Yeah, that'll work. Cool. This is yours, right? Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, so um, if you saw my talk earlier today, you'll know that I'm um, increasingly interested in what to do with all this content that we've been working to get into digital form and get into repositories and share. And I recently have been, thank you, have been learning about open annotation and it really strikes my fancy. Uh, so, what is annotation? Uh, this is somebody, a scholar's marked up version of Ulysses. Look at all those annotations. They had a lot to say about this thing, right? I recently was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Flame, Fame, and outside they have this. And I took a picture of it, I posted it to my Facebook page, and a few people liked it. A like is a form of annotation. We do it all the time. So turns out the web annotation has been part of the web, at least in conceptually, since the beginning. Mark Andreessen had put it in Mosaic and then took it out. And there's all these other, there's this whole timeline around annotation. <clears throat> so why do people annotate? Bunch of reasons, highlighting, bookmarking, commenting, tagging, classifying, studying, questioning, replying, editing, all these things. Like I said, we do it all the time. So what is an annotation? This is kind of the official definition for this, what we're talking about in this context. A set of connected resources, typically including a body and a target, and where the body is related to the target. Here's the basic data model. 
Do I need to explain this? There, <laughs> uh, here's the body of the, you know, the, the substance of the comment or the annotation itself, the target, the thing that you're commenting, and then this relationship through RDF. There's a web link here if you want to find out more about this. Um, so lots of scholarly applications for this. Peer review. Uh, just when you're organizing your and bookmarking stuff that you're working with, if somebody's looking at a data set and saying, hmm, I should, I should bookmark this, I should use this. Uh, or when you're tagging stuff out on the web, as some, you know, some astronomer comes along, sees this picture, and is like, oh, I think I see a planet out there, let's tag that. So, in terms of open annotations, what does it mean for video? Uh, or audio for that matter, but any kind of media resource. Well, video or audio can be the target, the thing that is being annotated. Um, and people do this all the time on YouTube. I mean, not in any kind of formal way, but it's there. Um, but video could also be the format of the annotation. You could do a little, uh, you know, a little recording of yourself talking about how Ulysses is interesting. Um, Open annotation will support segments of a video where you can just comment on a part or the whole thing. And you can do rectangular regions, a part of the frame, or of course, the whole frame. So, um, oh, this is the problem with PDFing it, is that it unhid all the things I was hiding. Because I borrowed these slides from somebody. So I'm going to go back to this. Do, do, do. Thanks for your patience. Uh, it just doesn't like this. That's too bad. Here we go. So here, okay, yes. Yes. Okay, so can you see that good enough? Yep. Okay, so it is becoming a W3, uh, 3C standard. <clears throat> It has a very strong community effort. It's one of the most successful W3C community groups ever, apparently. 138 participants, it's the fifth largest of, out of 179, and anyone can join, even you. Uh, we are doing a pilot right now, like kicking it off this week. I'm not involved in this, but, because uh, I'm here. But <laughs> uh, we're gonna be storing annotations about digitized medieval manuscripts in a Fedora 4 repository. That's the latest version of Fedora 4, so we're kind of testing it as a large-scale repository, but also testing this model. And this is part of the Linked Data for Libraries project that Stanford's currently involved in. And there's a link if you want to hear more about that. Um, the real expert on this is not me. It is my uh, colleague, Rob Sanderson, who recently joined the Stanford staff. He's a brilliant guy, and he's a, the community co-chair, and he's going to make this happen. And it's really going to change the way we do all of our work. That's it. is Eric Pio. <laughs> All right. I'll be quicker than seven minutes. Come on. Great. All right. Just, uh, I'm going to start with this. Um, it's kind of like the wobbling pivot of moving image archiving. Is technology going to shape and control the archive, or are we going to shape technology to suit the archive? Um, uh, we find ourselves doing this all the time. Uh, DIY projects and um, uh, re-engineering uh, specific technology to make it uh, suitable to our ends for preservation. So um, I see the DIY scene and, and, and uh, the preservation community as being like very intertwined. Um, so uh, as an individual, I'm like very, uh, I ask a lot of questions about technology and um, I do a lot of experiments and um, maybe a bad thing, but I don't accept rules and restrictions that um, don't really make any sense to me. Um, and there are a lot of them out there, so um, we try to tackle a few at a time uh, with the resources that we have. So um, one of the problems that I had uh, I should mention my affiliations. I have about five of them, but um, I primarily work at Anthology Film Archives in New York. And uh, one of the bigger problems we have with the video collection, I'm, I'm, 
I specialize in analog video uh, preservation and restoration. And one of the bigger problems that we have is that 90% uh, of our collection is, is uh, very sticky. And um, there's going to be a lot of conservation techniques applied to our collection before digitization. And uh, it's not really cost effective uh, to send it out to a vendor. Um, I also happen to be a vendor and I also know how to do this stuff professionally, uh, which not many people uh, do, but I have that knowledge. So I want to bring that knowledge in-house uh, and, and make it affordable and not be uh, a major time waster. So just just a, an example of um, uh, you know oxide. I, everyone's seen this before. Um, now there, um, if anybody knows the, um, I guess, t tape cleaning scene, there are a lot of already DIY practices in there. Um, and it's basically, it's not cost effective for us to buy, um, you know, one machine that does one format. Um, and I respect RTI as a company. I'm not, I'm not knocking them here per se, but um, it just can't really um, afford that when we have multiple formats that, um, that need cleaning and baking. And you need to clean after you bake. That's, you know, having an oven in an archive is not a solution to this. You need to have both of these things uh, working in concert with each other. So about um, a year and a half ago, I just started designing um, different uh, uh, tape paths and scenarios using um, uh, different tape cleaners as models. Um, I wanted to kind of um, encompass like multiple formats, so um, half inch, uh, quarter inch, VHS, U-Matic, uh, Betacam, things like that. And then started to pool um, a lot of things that were just available to me. So for example, these are like old um, DC motors pulled from U-Matic decks and uh, a power supply and uh, just see how much on the cheap I could, I could, I could build a cleaner. Um, and so the underlying technology that I was using was, is all open source, so it's Arduino um, with a motor shield on top of it. So it's able to control up to uh, four DC motors and then two continuous uh, servo motors. So what I decided to do was, uh, to get a little bit wonkish with this, um, use the servos to control a, a, a Pellon system on both sides of the tape and then use the motors to just control the take up and the supply reels. So, um, you know, for about a year and a half, I was just starting to like experiment and mess around and, uh, you know, trying to hit a, a few benchmarks um, working uh, beyond full time. So, um, about, so I, I premiered a little bit of this at MIA last year and then um, dug back into it and um, decided to scrap um, the whole cassette based uh, idea of tape cleaning and, um, just using specific spindles. So we actually modified, um, when I say we, I mean um, uh, Maurice Schechter from Duart and uh, Dave from CUNY and um, his engineer Flip. We actually uh, modified um, several spindles to just um, be uh, 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 modified. So you just put one on top of the other. So you can just put your cassette uh, spindles on top of it, which actually was really a, a lot more graceful solution than designing a uh, cartridge that would have like an elevator per se. So um, so here's like a little bit more cleaned up version of it with the Pellon uh, rolls uh, take up and supply and the, uh, uh, the tape path. Um, I showed these last year. And then here's kind of like a breakdown of the budget that I, um, that I worked with. Um, super cheap. I mean, if anyone's bought a tape cleaner, it's, you know, for one format, you're, you know, it's definitely a fraction of that. Um, I don't know what the fraction is, but just think about that. I mean, uh, you know, um, in thinking about openness and open source technology, you know, there are definitely niches within the field um, uh, and points that we can exploit using open source software. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to uh, grab some low hanging fruit here. So I'm sure there are plenty of other sophisticated technologies that we can apply open source technology to. Secret note? Okay. 
<laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine from AV Preserve, and I'm also here to talk about something else from AV Preserve. Um, it's a tool called Fixity, which, surprise, surprise, has to do with Fixity. Um, so just to kind of give you an overview, you may have heard of it or seen it or maybe even used it, and if that's the case, um, please come talk to us. We'd love to hear how you're using it, what you're doing, um, how it's working. Uh, so essentially, it's just a free, open source tool, utility, um, that provides automated documentation and review of stored files. Um, it does this through the creation and validation of either MD5 or SHA-256 checksums, and um, also allows for the monitoring of file attendance. So what that means is are the files that you expect to be there there, and um, are there any new files? Have they been changed in any way? Have their um, locations or file names been changed? And so, um, it's currently, as I said, in um, version 0.4. It's available for Windows and Mac operating systems um, as of this new version. And uh, the link is available at the end of this presentation. Or if you just use that uh, internet search that shall not be named, according to Ian, um, just AV Preserve and fix it, and it'll pop right up. Um, so before I really get into demonstrating what it does and how it does it, um, I want to talk about why it was created and why it's available to the community. Um, there's a huge issue with Fixity. It's something that everyone talks about, everyone knows um, it's a central tenet of digital preservation along with authenticity. And um, because of that, it's, it's obviously in all of our you know, crosshairs, but um, even though some organizations or individuals may be generating checksums, there is essentially a very small group that is actually doing periodic and controlled and managed validation of those checksums. Um, in any capacity. And so this is understandable because the current tool set that was available um, didn't really allow that to happen for any number of reasons. Um, the most important one being that the tool sets were really for super IT tech heavy folks. And um, while that's great and that's totally usable by them, um, that's not always the situation that you're in when you're in your archive or um, a library or any other organization that has content. Um, so those tool sets were for a very specified group of people. And if you weren't that group of people, you had to rely on that group of people. And as we're all aware, sometimes resources are stretched a bit thin. And sometimes you can't get your IT department to give you the appropriate amount of attention for what you need to do and then adding in a whole nother management of um, file fixity data integrity is just sort of adding to existing issues. So these are all kinds of the background reasons why there was a, a need for a really simplistic, easy to use, non-IT tech heavy tool. Um, and, and that's what we have with Fixity. Um, the, the other part before I move on is also that the tool sets that were available didn't integrate uh, like checksum fixity checking with file attendance. And um, I think it's kind of important to know what files you're checking the integrity of, right? Like that's something that you would be interested to know in your collections. Yes, can I get one head nod? Yes, okay, great. On to the next slide. Um, so how Fixity actually does this is, as I mentioned, um, creating and validating checksums. Um, so this happens, uh, you can choose MD5 or SHA-256, as I mentioned, and um, a manifest is created of the full file path and the associated checksum. Um, then you can set a schedule for when that manifest is checked against, and every time that it um, fixes you runs a scan according to a schedule that you set as you seem appropriate, as you deem appropriate rather, um, it will check it and it will tell you what happens. So that's what happens over here. This middle part is actually the report. This is a tab separated value or TSV file um, that contains a lot of things, but um, we'll get to that a bit later. But as I mentioned, the checksums and the file pass, and um, sorry, the file pass, and then indication of if anything has been altered. So moved, missing, um, new files, renamed, what have you, it's, in, it's gonna be in there. Um, and the really cool thing about it is it saves it locally um, to a dedicated folder. And then it also emails a designated users, so designated participants to just shoot their email in there and it shoots it off anytime you schedule it to. So this is the interface, um, super, super simple. I'm actually gonna come back to this because I wanna show you the report first. Um, 
may be hard to read, but essentially what is in here is header information saying it's a fixity report, um, the project name, the algorithm used, the date of the scan, the total files scanned, and then a summary um, in this area of confirmed files, moved or renamed new files, changed files, and removed files. And then below here, sort of um, row 11 and down, as I mentioned, the file paths and then what actually happened to them. So you have the high level sort of summary information and then you have the file level information. Um, also note in the moved or renamed categories, um, for example, row 14, um, you have the original file path and then change to and the new file path. So super easy. Don't have to have any technical knowledge about anything to understand this. Um, you just have to have some kind of non-denominational spreadsheet reader. I learned a lot today in that uh, keynote. So, <laughs> lots. Um, another thing that I don't have an example of, but it kind of looks the same, it's just another spreadsheet, um, is the history. There's a history directory in the Fixity file structure, and what it does is provide snapshots of your data at any given scan moment. Um, and this is really useful. It doesn't have this summary information. It's literally just what your data looks like at that moment. And it also includes um, another thing that I didn't mention, but is available as a preference. Um, if you want to filter out certain files, for example, if you're um, scanning a directory full of access and master image files, if that happens to be all in one directory, um, and you have TIFFs and JPEGs and whatever you have, and you're like, wait, I don't want to scan JPEGs. Like, eh, we're not going to do that. Um, you just type in the extension into Fixity in a certain menu, and it will just skip over those. And you'll only have to worry about if you're just worried about TIFFs. That's what your report's going to say. Um, so yeah, thank you. This is the link. That's my information. Come talk to me. Thank you. Um, I'm Casey Davis. I work at WGBH. Um, I'm, I'm the project manager for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Um, today I'm going to uh, give you a demo of our um, uh, archival management system that was developed by AV Preserve. Um, the archival management system uh, is a tool that is tracking our digitization project and all of our metadata. Um, so let me log in. Okay, um, so yeah, basically the archival management system um, is a way that we are managing the workflow and the progress of our digitization project. Um, there are nearly a hundred stations that are having materials digitized through the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Um, so the archival management system, or AMS, is the central location where um, station admins go and where the archive, uh, American Archive team goes and where Crawford, our digitization vendor, um, goes to uh, manage the workflow and manage the project and um, stay up to date on the progress of the digitization. Um, so this is the home page or the dashboard that um, the, an admin would land on when you log in. Um, it shows how many hours have been digitized, what percentage of uh, content has been digitized of the 40,000 hours. Um, it tracks the digitization by region, um, how many scheduled assets have been digitized and how many have, um, uh, have uh, by format, uh, let's see, and by um, radio or television. And then if you scroll down, you can look at and see all of the different formats that are being digitized and how many are being digitized. Um, let's see. There are, so I said, there's three main users for the AMS. There are the American Archive team, and there are station admins who log in and are able to view all of their metadata records and all of their, the proxy files that have been generated through the project. And there, and there's Crawford, that's our digitization vendor. Um, the AMS doesn't manage the media itself, it manages the metadata, and um, there, there's a player within each detail of each rec of, of the records um, that points to the proxy file that's being stored on the server at Crawford. Um, let's see. So this is the records page um, that one would land on. Um, you'll see this, the blue highlighted uh, tab is assets and there are instantiations. So we have two million uh, 160,000 assets. Um, and then if you click on instantiations, you look at, you're seeing a, 
um, table of all of the instantiations. So there are more instantiations because there are 40, uh, about 56,000 assets that are being digitized and three um, video instantiations that are being created for each digitized video and then two instantiations for all audio. Um, I should say that the AMS um, runs on a LAMP um, plat um, technology stack. Um, there are 92 or 91 tables in the AMS schema um, based on the PB Core data model. Um, so uh, let's see what else. Oh, obviously one may want to search the AMS. So there are different uh, browsing uh, functions that are available, and then there's a keyword search. Um, let's see. I, and also, I should note that um, you can filter by what's been digitized. Um, so if I click reformatted, you can, um, all of the digitized assets appear in the records or assets um, table. Also nomination status is what we're using to nominate assets based on priority of digitization. Um, so anything that was nominated first priority is uh, prob likely going to be digitized in the project unless it failed to digitize. Um, and then second priority are materials that we would like to digitize in the future for future projects. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are participating, so as, a, as an admin of the system, I can view all of the different stations that are participating. Any station user that would log in can only see their, um, all of their records. So I will go and click on an, um, just one record, and this will take you to the uh, detailed view of the page, or, or one record for an asset. Um, the blue highlighted um, tab is, this is the asset information, and below it are all of the instantiations. So there's a video player um, or audio player um, that one would be able to view or listen to a proxy file. Let's see. You can also edit assets. You can edit the metadata about one uh, individual asset manually, or you can add new physical instantiations. So if you find another tape, um, then you can add a new instantiation of that asset. And here you see all of the in intellectual content metadata um, for this asset. So um, let's see. So the first instantiation below asset information is always going to be uh, the master tape. And in this case, it was a quarter inch audio tape. And here below it, you'll see all of the event metadata that's created by Crawford um, and is ingested into the AMS via Google Doc, uh, the Google Doc API. And below it are the, is the preservation master, the digital file, and the proxy file. Um, there's two instantiations, as I said, created for audio. So there's only going to be two additional instantiations at this point. Um, and here's all of the technical metadata about the preservation file. And below it um, is the media info metadata that's also being generated by Crawford and is ingested um, into our onto our server. And then obviously there's the proxy instantiation and all of its um, technical metadata as well. And also you can edit instantiations. Currently in the AMS you can only edit um, physical instantiations. Oh, I have a lot more to have to cover in one minute. So, <laughs> so uh, we have all of these assets, but we have been adding new assets, and you don't have to just manually add new assets or instantiations. You can batch import um, assets and instantiations via Mint, which is a mapping tool, open source mapping tool created by University of Athens in Europe. Um, and we've integrated that so we can import CSV or PB Core XML and map it to the AMS um, PB Core schema and import it into our into the AMS. And let's see what else. Also, if you're going to import um, assets and instantiations at some point you may want to export so um, you can export limited CSVs which is what most of the stations want because a lot of the stations don't use PB Core XML um, so the limited CSV has just the GUID, the local identifier, um, the title, the um, the format, the nomination status and then you can also export a bagot which has the all of um, a set a uh, found set of records that you want to search for, and uh, it has a PB Core XML record of checksums. It has um, the premise metadata also if it has been digitized. 
and I believe that's all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Stop reading my email. Okay, while Mark hooks up, we're gonna I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna show you a demo of uh, uh, WGBH's Hydrodan based on the oh, it's all set. Nope, oh. yeah, based on the uh, <laughs> Hydra Tech Stack. Um, we're gonna do a live demo, so hopefully um, all of you guys will stop being on the internet so that um, we can get a clean signal in. Um, oh no, Mark we're, is, we're all right here. Mark I don't is, trust the internet. Oh, okay. Mark is brave enough to do a demo here. Um, one thing that we didn't mention earlier um, when I was showing the slides is that you, it does have the ability to, well, I think Mark will show you too, the ability to tag things for access. So you can have everything, things that you um, ingest as being open access or private access, it has those controls. So are you ready to go? Sure. Okay. Uh, oh, but you can't take my notes because I have to know what I'm supposed <laughs> to show. <laughs> oh, also, um, this is based on the Penn State Sophia. Um, product, uh, solution bundle, um, DCE, digital curation expert, of which Mark is part of, um, helped build out the, their version of this for us. There's actually pieces from many parts. As I we happen to be looking at code for another project, I realized how much of the PB core export that we're going to show you is actually the work of Adam Weed during his tenure at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, if we were to go through and comb through this code, there are pieces from, from all across the Hydra community. Um, so as Karen said, the main design is from um, Penn State ScholarSphere, which is a self-deposit um, institutional repository. And their goal was to make it easy to uh, get folks in the scholarly community to give content to them. Um, but that was a key driver for WGBH as well. Um, so to get content in, I just find something I want to upload. So here's my movie. And I say start upload. Um, Kevin and the two. Um, I get to choose a little bit of metadata about this. WGBH. Husha. Wait, I can't spell in front of people. <laughs> There we go. Oh, we'll keep this private. Uh, so one of the things Karen was talking about was the fact that I can select as I upload content as an administrator or a contributor, um, whether I want this to be available open access, uh, limited to the institution, we're set up for WGBH, but you can install this for whatever institution, or keep it private to me so that uh, you uh, have the ability to manage this, the content, but it's not being displayed and um, shown. And that's in, in sort of harmony with also what rights assertions I'm making about the, the object and, and who might be able to use it. So I'm actually going to make Kevin open access. Um, so while I'm doing that, we'll see that I've just uploaded something. While it's uploading and being characterized, it stays private. Later on, it'll become open access. Um, the system was uh, primarily envisioned to handle audio and video, but because we inherited it from um, this other area, we have the ability to pull in images, text, all kinds of other things. So for instance, if I have, oh, Chicago, um, perhaps a, a video that I might have the transcript of, um, in addition to bringing in the video, I happen to have a PDF of the transcript so I can um, bring in and download the transcript, um, which turns out to be handy. Um, I have the ability, so you saw that there was a very limited amount of metadata. I could have actually opened up a form and given much more metadata as I uh, uploaded the object, but I also have the ability to go back at a later date and edit a fairly extensive set of PB core metadata. And once I've done that, um, so you just saw that I had lots of fields filled. Uh, we actually have the ability to export this to PB Core so that it can be interchanged with any other system that's capable of reading PB Core. Um, although I was noticing that uh, we're 1.3 because of when this was minted and it's time to do some updates. Um, 
And then I already talked about rights and access. So again, um, actually, let's go back. And my latest isn't here yet. Let's look at Karen's dashboard. I'm Karen right now. You're much taller. There, Kevin and the two. Um, so one of the things that will happen, oh, we got flipped, um, is uh, we'll get a thumbnail of the uh, initial still. We have a little playback. We can play bigger. <laughs> There's a person in that too. I can't flip that, but. Um, our system administrator got stuck in our two suits. That's what happened. You all have two suits, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, uh, having done this, I can go edit this. I can. Kevin might not like this being shown, so I'm going to make it. I'm going to require you to log in and be a member of WGBH. Um, so, for instance, right now as a user, I can search for Kevin and the two. If I happen to log out now, because we have gated discovery, because I'm not logged in, we won't see that any longer. Um, that's my list of things to show on it. We just wanted to show it live because there were lots of sort of screenshots of it earlier. Um, but if you have any questions, come up and talk to Karen and I. All right, so let's open it up for if there's Q&A for any of the people who presented, go ahead and shout it out. I have a question for Eric, if nobody else has a question, is, which is, are you, are you, the documentation with that, are you putting that in like GitHub or anything, or is this just something you've been working yeah, on? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, once the code's a little bit better, um, it's been really hard trying to like, uh, the, the coding has been hard to pick up, and especially related to things that I want to do through Arduino, because the, you can probably do better um, with just regular like hardware hacks, like so for example, the palinoles have to move like very slowly, um, and somebody was like, well maybe you can use uh, a motor from like a clock or something like that, and in order, I want to incorporate all of like the motor shield with an Arduino, so it's, the code's got it, the code's gonna be there. Cool. Yeah. And I guess that's be a good question for everybody. Maybe if you didn't mention it, where can people find what you presented on today? The uh, AMS is on Edserve slash AMS, and I forgot one really important On GitHub, thing. right? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. you mean, yeah, yeah. It's on uh, GitHub. Really important issue, uh, thing with the AMS is that you can use OpenRefine to batch um, refined data, which is really important. Our data is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Hydrogen is on GitHub, um, on the curation experts repo, but it's publicly available. It's publicly available. And Fixity is also on GitHub, publicly available. The open annotation stuff is on the W3C website. Okay, great. Eric, are you looking for collaborators on your open hardware hacking? Yeah, collaborators, money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, more like uh, coders. Right. They're really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have all the ingredients, but it's a matter of like getting good chefs. So I think Michael was interested in this very much, but I imagine there might be others. Yeah. No Arduino and, and you know. Yeah, I'll put, I'll put the you list and, and the code that I'm working with on online like this week. If there's if there are no other questions, there are questions, please shout them out. Yeah. Um, I have a question. For, um, for the uh, for the fixity reports, uh, do they come out flat like that, or so it doesn't look like it comes out in a, in a structured way at all? Where you possibly do more dynamic reporting, like see over, like do a visualization see over time? So I'll, let me. So I don't think the folks in the back can hear. So, maybe. so the question is, does the fixity report is it just flat like we saw, or is it more structured? It's it's flat but structured. I mean, it's a CSV, so if you want to report it out. Something you want to throw a little script together and create something a little bit more um, pretty. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's really extendable. Nice. I said so it's flat, but it par it's par easily parsable. Easily parsable. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Is so. Fixity multi-platform yet, or is it, it is multi-platform. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody, I think it was the artifactual folks mentioned that they were had got it to run on Ubuntu. I I was unable to do that, so. I'm, Curious to hear how they did that. It's mm -hmm. it's Mac and, and Windows currently, but uh, the scheduling is different between those. Anyway, 
Any other questions? If not, if there's no questions, I'd love to hear if other people have things that they want to mention that they're working on or know of or in this area. Yes, good. Hopefully this time next year I'll know how to retrofit LEDs into film viewers and projectors. So you replace the old bulb with a new LED. Well, okay. that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Or? <laughs> You could come up and then you... No, no, I'm good. That's all I got. <laughs> Chris, I completely forgot to distribute the piece of paper to collect people's ideas, but maybe we can just do it now. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so if you want to... Yeah, sure. Yeah, so today in the Open Source Committee meeting, we were just talking about... Um, we will do a, 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 a little bit of a survey. Um, we'll have a little bit of a survey. 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 We'll have a little just get the kind of low-hanging fruit on thoughts for what people are hungry uh, for more of, or thoughts on maybe presentations for next year, or things along the, you know in this same domain. So if, if people have thoughts on it, or workshops, or workshops. You're talking about maybe if there's a need for like introductory kind of command line, or like you know LAMP 101 kind of workshops before the conference, maybe before Hack Day, so that you feel more comfortable going into Hack Day, things like that. Um, maybe it's more Any thoughts on that? Come on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do people like the lightning talk? Yeah. 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 Yes. What about Hack Day? How many people yeah. play this Hack Day? Yeah. Hack Day! How many people use open source software in their organization? How many have actually done development on open source software? We have a lot of users. Maybe 25 percent, 30 percent development. So what did what did we? Oh yes. Yeah, Can I make a shout out? Is uh, part of the hydro steering group. Um, one of our biggest challenges is documentation, and part of the problem is the folks who are deep in the weeds of building this stuff um, already know it and don't know what's not obvious to the folks using it. As a user, you can be tremendously valuable to whatever project you're working with to volunteer a little time to help write some documentation up, even if it's two paragraphs. But two paragraphs that we've never gotten written before. And, uh, I know from our project, we would love you, and I can't imagine that that's not true for every other project. So, so Mark's love. <laughs> yeah, last year, actually, one of the winners of Hack Day was a documentation project on FFNPEG. There was more of that this year. What happened with that? So Does anybody know? Yeah, I'll get on it. Get on it. On Wednesday. Well, that's why I haven't seen it. Well, it's still there. I know, but there, there was yeah, there was more documentation this time. But last year's documentation was posted to GitHub, and I think it was distributed after the conference. The link or whatever. It's actually it's under the it's under the EMEA Open Source Committee uh, GitHub account. It's also on the hack day page at the bottom by the edit of thon stuff. It's well documented. Because <laughs> that's what we do. So we, will, <laughs> we, will, we will post that again. <laughs> yeah. When is the other hack day events? For the people that do not know. Like Sounds like yeah. you know. <laughs> 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 other hack day events. What do you know? Oh, at this conference? With the judging. Oh, so tomorrow evening there will be judging. So the, the folks who participated, including everyone who participated in the edit of fawning, um, will be judged by a panel of esteemed judges, some of whom are in the room. Um, and then the, uh, the results, all results will be presented on Saturday morning. Unfortunately, we only have 30 minutes to present, like two minutes per project probably eat that and then say who the winners are. And then it, doesn't that include a vote by by moving okay, your body into a place in the room? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'm kind of sad about it is that we don't really get to show off the tools yeah. that well. Like that's a little bit of a bummer. Um, because it's just like a it's a lightning 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 talk. Like yeah. we made this tool. Ah, ah. Okay, go. <laughs> 
Yeah, the, I mean, we wanted on the on the plus side, it's a plenary, so we get to be in front of the whole organization. On the downside, it's very limited time. But yeah, maybe that's something we can push for next year. Yeah, if you guys like the day results and you want to see more, tell me we need more time in the plenary to show them. Yeah. Yeah, your board member. <laughs> okay. Uh, Any other thoughts or questions? Yes. Just wondering in general, will the, the slides from today's presentations be available in a central place? Yeah, I think that the answer to that question is is yes for most, if not all of them. But but certainly we I was I was video recording and, and we, we we have yet I have yet I was slacking on distributing release forms. But so there's other video recording that happens at AMIA, which actually goes into AMIA's archive. It's not made accessible. I would like to make for everybody who agrees. We will make the video publicly accessible, and I imagine people will make their presentations publicly accessible as well. Anything else? No? Okay, well, I guess like the lightning talk, we don't have to use all of our time. That's pretty tired. <laughs> so thank you so much, everybody, for uh, attending. Thank you to the presenters, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody around. Thanks.